Welcome. This is the second video in a series of short videos introducing statistical concepts relevant to proteomics. Today I'm going to be talking about missing data and in particular focusing on the type of missing data that we call not ignorable missingness in, in statistics. Okay, so um, last week Nikolai talked about um, a conceptual overview of uh, the technical and biological reasons for missingness in proteomics. Today, I'm going to focus on a slightly more um, statistical overview of what kinds of missingness can be ignored and why. Um, so first, um, we should emphasize that information about how the data were collected should always be incorporated into the analysis. So anytime you're using off the shelf tools, uh, you're, you're sort of implicitly not uh, thinking as carefully about uh, how your data were collected. And in particular, this is important when we think about missing data, um, where we can use a probability model to try to recover complete data parameters, things we would like to learn from the complete data from partially observed data. Now, non-ignorable missingness comes up in uh, a range of uh, applications and domains. Uh, in clinical trials, uh, sometimes we call this informative dropout, where a patient or a subject is no longer in the study, either because they opted out or uh, perhaps due to death. And the fact that they are no longer in the study is informative about um, the, uh, the intervention that's being examined. Okay. Um, now, there's a very popular example on social media that many of you may have seen. Uh, this is due to um, Abraham Wald, who was a statistician during World War II, uh, studying um, uh, bullet holes on, on airplanes and where to reinforce the, uh, reinforce the airplanes. I'm not going to go into this example in depth, but I encourage you to, uh, to read about it on Wikipedia if you aren't familiar with it. Uh, most importantly, uh, we call non-ignorable missingness uh, non-ignorable. Because when you do ignore it, then you incur a kind of survivor bias. Okay. Now, when we talk about proteomics, we'll think of um, the observed peptides or proteins as the survivors. And uh, they can be systematically different in their abundances than the non-survivors, the peptides or proteins, which were not measured. In statistics, we have another term for not ignorable missing data, uh, and we call this kind of missingness missing not at random, which um, is not the best not the best name in the world, but it's stuck around. So I wanted to introduce a little bit of notation. So imagine that we're analyzing peptide intensities, and we can conceptualize a, a complete matrix of every peptide in the sample and uh, several runs as columns in a matrix. And we'll use Y to denote the peptide intensities. So in uh, row I and column J, we have uh, the peptide intensity for peptide I in run J. Now, in actuality, we don't observe every intensity. We only observe some of them. And part of the data we have is which peptides we measure or don't measure. So we'll think of M as a matrix of indicator variables, which tell us which peptides are observed and which ones are not observed. So the squares in, right, in, in white will be um, peptides that were observed, and the squares in black are uh, the ones that are missing. Um, now, we'd like to distinguish between peptides that are observed and missing using some shorthand y obs and y miss. Okay. So, on the left, y obs indicates the intensities of the peptides that we observe. Okay. And those blue x's are the missing unknown intensities. Now, what we don't get to see is the matrix y miss, which contains 
the missing intensities. Why OBS and why miss together give us the complete data, what we wish we had if there were no missing values at all. So the question we have now, given that there are missing values, is um, what can we infer from those missing values and how should we do it? So we can think about uh, theta being the parameters that govern the complete data, all of the peptide intensities in our sample. And if we knew what theta was, then we could get all of the biological insights that we might like. Uh, theta might tell us the differential abundances across, um, across two samples of, uh, of the proteins, or theta might give us correlations between proteins that are useful for uh, characterizing uh, uh, protein interaction now. So uh, the question we have is, well, if we had the complete data, then we could learn about theta using uh, sort of classical statistical techniques for inference. Now, since there are missing values, we have uh, another question, which is when can we get unbiased or accurate estimates of this parameter theta from y opt, the observed data alone? Well, to do that, we need to think about the joint distribution of peptide intensities and the matrix of missingness indicators. Okay, so um, what we'll do is we're gonna write this joint distribution. We're gonna model the peptide intensities and which ones were observed given two parameters. As before, we can factor this in terms of, well, the parameter theta, which tells us everything we need to know about the distribution of peptide intensities across all peptides, and a missingness mechanism, which gives us the probability model for which peptides are missing given the complete uh, matrix of peptide intensities and some parameters phi that tell us exactly how those values are missing. So as before, theta is the parameter of interest. Phi, you can think of as a nuisance parameter, which basically tells us something about which values are missing and how they relate to the intensities of the peptides. So here's a cartoon of uh, peptide intensities or abundances, and the um, the distribution of missing values and observed values for each peptide across multiple peptides. Okay. So in this particular example, I've set up a missing mo missingness model in which the probability that a peptide is missing is a function of its abundance. The lower the abundance, the higher the probability that that peptide is missing. Okay. The higher the abundance, the, the more likely we are to observe that peptide. So below we can see that there's actually a difference in the distributions between the, uh, the abundances for a given peptide given that they were observed and the abundances of those peptides that, of that peptide uh, when they were not observed. Okay. So in this particular plot, uh, the blue densities are things we can actually recover from the, the, the observed data. Um, and we never actually get to see those, those red densities. But the important thing being here that the distribution of missing data looks different than the distribution of observed data. And if we don't take into account this missing this mechanism, then we might get a kind of survivor bias. Um, now, the particular example I just described where the probability of missingness depends on the abundance of the peptide is something that we sometimes call self-masking missingness because the probability that um, peptide I in run J is, is observed depends only on its own abundance. Um, as Nikolai described uh, excellently last, uh, in the last video, uh, this may be an oversimplification. For example, in data-dependent acquisition, we know there's a competition amongst the peptides uh, 
in which only some small number of peptides can be, um, can be analyzed at a given uh, retention time. And so there, the missingness doesn't depend uh, only on that, that peptide's abundance. It also depends on the abundances of some of the other peptides uh, in the uh, sample. OK. So um, in a little bit more depth, there are three kind characterizations of missingness that we often talk about in statistics. The first is by far the most simple, and it's what we call missing completely at random, or MCAR. And MCAR basically says, well, the model for the missingness matrix, given the peptide intensities, it actually doesn't depend on the peptide intensities at all. In other words, it only depends on some parameter phi. So we could think of that as each entry in um, the missingness matrix being uh, generated by a coin flip. Right? The probability of missingness doesn't depend on the intensities at all. That's the simplest. Now, the one that's more relevant in practice is what we call missing at random, MAR, M-A-R. And this one is uh, a slight generalization. So the, the model for the missingness matrix depends only on the observed values. It does not depend on the missing values. And this assumption is the one that's uh, commonly used in many off-the-shelf imputation algorithms um, or matrix completion methods, because it basically uh, assumes that we can recover um, the model for the missingness given the pattern of observed intensities. The one we'll be focusing on a bit more in this lecture is what we call missing not at random, or MNAR. And here, we can not make any simplifying assumptions about this um, model for the missingness. In other words, the probability of missingness depends on the complete data. We need to condition on both the values we observe and the values we don't, y obs and y miss. And an example of this would be exactly that self-masking missingness example that I gave on the previous page, where the probability of missingness depends on that the peptides possibly missing abundance. Now, this is relevant for what we call ignorability, because NCAR and MAR missingness mechanisms um, make it so that we can do inference for theta, the parameter we care about, without having to know anything about the parameters governing the missingness model. In other words, inference for theta is invariant to the parameters phi. On the other hand, when we have missing not at random data, then the appropriate inference for theta, what we care about, does depend on phi, the parameters governing the missingness model. So when we have MCAR and MAR data, we can ignore phi, but when we have MNAR data, it's non-ignorable. Ignoring phi will lead to biased estimates of data. Now, most importantly, none of these missing data types, missing this types, can be determined from the observed data. So you can't look at any observed data and tell whether it's MCAR, MAR, or MNAR. You can't tell whether it's ignorable or not ignorable. And that's why the lecture that Nikolai gave in the last video is so important, because we have to use our knowledge about mass spectrometry and proteomics to um, make plausible assumptions about the most likely types of missingness. And in particular, for proteomics, we do indeed suspect that there are important uh, not ignorable missingness mechanisms. There are a few other um, distinctions I'd like to make. So within not ignorable missingness uh, patterns, we can think about non ignorable missingness with a known mechanism. So for example, uh, when the protein abundance is below some known detection limit, well, we know exactly what that, that probabilistic mechanism is. We have to account for it, but we have it. 
Now, a much more challenging situation is when we have non-ignorable missingness with an unknown mechanism. Um, for example, when the protein is not analyzed, well, we know that this is a strongly abundance-dependent process, but it's very difficult to, to specify precisely what that mechanism, uh, what, the, what that probabilistic missingness mechanism looks like. There is uh, one more distinction I'd like to make. So far, I've assumed that this missingness matrix M is observed and completely available to us, but that's not always the case. Uh, so I like to think about the unknown unknowns as things that we didn't measure that we may not have known we didn't measure. So one example of that might be um, proteoforms, post-translationally modified proteins that uh, exist, but we may not we may not know about. So those are rows of Y and M, which uh, aren't even in, in included uh, because we aren't aware of them. And there are certain contexts in which it's also important to think about those unknown unknowns. Now I would encourage you go, to go back to uh, Nikolai's first video where he um, outlined various uh, mechanisms by which a protein or a peptide might, uh, might not be measured. And think about for each of these various mechanisms, whether you would characterize it as uh, missing completely at random, missing at random, or missing not at random. And also to think about whether the mechanism is itself known, you could write down a probability model for exactly how that missingness arose, or whether that was an unknown mechanism. So that's a high level overview of how to think about the different types of missingness. Now, uh, the, the next step is to think about how we can uh, take, take into account what we know about the missingness mechanisms and propagate that uncertainty through to our inference about um, uh, the parameters that we care about to our biological insights. So the first thing we have to do is we have to incorporate extra uncertainty into our estimates due to the fact that the missing values are in fact unknown. Okay. Um, and one way that uh, is commonly, uh, commonly used to uh, incorporate that extra uncertainty is what we call multiple imputation. It's to use a probability model to uh, impute plug in some missing values. Then with that newly imputed data set, you can uh, complete your statistical inference. But you can't stop there because when you do that, you're assuming that you're ignoring the fact that those imputed values were in fact missing. And so multiple imputation is one way of saying, repeat that process with um, different probabilistically imputed values. Um, each time so that you can see how much your estimates vary due to the fact that the missing values are unmeasured. The other thing that's going to be really important is some kind of sensitivity analysis or robustness uh, check. And now this is not about the actual imputation as much as it is about the assumptions about the missingness model itself. So as I mentioned, we we can't know from the data alone what the type of missingness is, whether it's MAR, MNAR, or MCAR. And so if we make assumptions about the missingness mechanism, we should see how our estimates vary as we perturb those assumptions in plausible ways. In the next video, we'll talk a little bit more about um, missing data imputation, what those methods look like, and how we might be able to benchmark the quality of um, different missingness models.